Okay, thank you, Brigadier, for that introduction, and thank you, Ikria, for having me here. Um, I always love to come to Delhi. Haven't been here in two years, so I'm very excited. Um, so as you can see, the title of my presentation is Engage and Hedge. Um, and as the title of this session is Frameworks for Engagement, this is one framework through which you can view US engagement in Asia. Um, and I'm going to try to present it that way. Keep in mind, this is not the only framework through which you can view US engagement in the Asia Pacific. But this, I hope, will be a useful categorization um, of US actions in the region as a way to kind of think about it. Um, and so for this presentation, because it's uh, 10 to 12 minutes is a sh short time, I'm not going to go through everything the U.S. has done for the region, or in the region um, since 1990. I'm going to take the relationship with China as a lens through which to examine the broader U.S. policy towards the region, um, and hopefully that will be useful. So the two broad policy imperatives driving U.S. policy towards China in the past the 25 years since the Cold War ended have been, number one, the imperative to engage, and number two, the imperative to hedge. So the need to engage is pretty obvious. China has been a rising power. There's no way you can just ignore them. So you have to engage with them. Um, and also, as the dominant power in the world system for, uh, after the Cold War, and to a certain extent up till now, the US has to um, engage with the rising power, which is China. Um, and also, it can create mutually beneficial situations economically and security-wise, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, but also, as with any um, dominant power and rising power, there's a need to hedge. So you've heard this called many things, the Thucydides trap, maybe. Um, so the U.S. has to hedge against the rise of China, uh, hedge against the possibility that China may be less than friendly. Um, so those strategies have also been employed. Balancing these two imperatives allows the U.S. to strive for a balance of power in Asia is what I put there. I know that's sort of a controversial term, um, and I don't mean it in the sense of the U.S. is encouraging competition in the damaging sense, more in the sense of the U.S. would like there to be um, no dominant power in Asia that can run roughshod over the others. The U.S. would prefer that there's a rules-based architecture um, because that reduces the need for uh, U.S. commitment and other countries' commitment for stabilization and increases possibilities uh, for economic engagement and mutual, mutually beneficial uh, progress for everyone. So this is how I'm going to lay out my presentation. There are three different dimensions of policy that I've identified, economic, military, and political, sorry, and diplomatic. And in each of those, there's two tracks, the engage and the hedge track. So you'll see in the top right, you can see where we are and you can see how long you have to put up with me for. Um, so, economic engagement. So, from 1990 to 2000, China, despite being a communist nation in, uh, in name, was a most favored nation under U.S. trade policy. So, because China was a communist nation, every year there had to be a review of this status. But it was always renewed, um, and that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of a result of the U.S. business community identifying the fact that we need to engage with China in order to uh, create economically beneficial trade relations, and also every time there was pressure to rescind that status, basically cooler heads prevailed, as we'll get into in the next slide. Um, but you can see from this graph the reason why the U.S. has to engage with China economically. Uh, it's pretty mind-boggling how much our trade with China has grown over the past 24 years in this chart. Um, it's basically gone up over 20 times, and now it's the number one trading partner of the U.S., whereas in 1990 it was only number 10. So it's basically the U.S. has had no choice but to economically engage with China. Um, also, in 2001, the China uh, became a member of the WTO, which can be seen as hedging, as I'll show in the next slide, but it also can be seen as a form of engagement because upon WTO ascension, the U.S. Uh, extended permanent normal trading relations with China, uh, so that was another form of engagement. And so... Beyond the natural engagement that happens with China's rapidly expanding economy and the U.S. economy, um, we have also, the U.S. has also engaged them with uh, preferential trade status, or at least not uh, normal trade status. And there's also a bilateral investment treaty slowly proceeding that may happen, not maybe the next step of engagement. Um, secondly, economic hedging. So it's taken a couple forms. 
a big form has been campaign rhetoric. So a lot of times domestically in the U.S., politicians will try to appear tough on China. So uh, Bill Clinton actually called the most favored nation status an unconscionable U.S. policy. But then when he became in office, he continued it. Um, same with currency man manipulation. A lot of candidates have done a lot of like rah-rah rhetoric about uh, labeling China a currency manipulator. And as you can see, this has been epitomized lately by Donald Trump, who unfortunately is a serious candidate for the US presidency right now. Um, and, but you can see his quote there. Uh, and Donald Trump really likes to, to ride that hobby horse. But so do a lot of candidates. It's a, it, it plays well domestically. Um, but then also WTO membership can be seen as a kind of hedge as well, because although it uh, WTO membership meant that the U.S. extended permanent normal trading relations to China. It also meant that China agreed to follow certain international norms in regards to trading and economic relations. So that can be seen as a hedge, right? It's bringing China into the multilateral institution and hedging against um, unilateral Chinese economic action. And finally, the most prominent economic hedge against China has been the TPP, which we've heard a lot of talk about today, so I won't belabor the point. But as you can see from this map, China is not in the TPP, although they have there are some questions about whether they may join. But as for now, it can be seen as a form of hedging, as a form of the US trying to reassert its um, economic engagement with the rest of Asia. Um, but China is not part of that. So moving on to the diplomatic track. So the US has maintained its engagement through a series of crises. Even when publicly the US has denounced China, as it did in the Ta Tiananmen Square aftermath, um, it has made sure to go through back channels and stay engaged. So after Tiananmen Square, um, President George H.W. Bush sent his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, to China to assure them privately that the U.S. would be lifting the sanctions that had been imposed as soon as possible. Um, also with Taiwan, so the U.S. is committed to strategic ambiguity, so to defending Taiwan but not saying exactly what the U.S. would do if China were to invade Taiwan. Um, but officially, we're also committed to the One China policy, um, so that's a form of engagement. Also, there have been more major international agreements where there's been engagement, so most notably the recent climate change agreement between uh, the U.S. and China ahead of the upcoming Paris talks, and then also bringing China into major diplomatic initiatives such as the Iran talks with the P5 plus one uh, and the six-party talks with North Korea. And then on the uh, right side of the slide here, you can see a, a chain of deepening and broadening formal mechanisms for U.S.-China diplomatic engagement. So starting in 1996 with comprehensive engagement, which is what Bill Clinton called it, um, but didn't really have a framework. That was kind of just um, meetings at the high level, but without a sustained framework. Then it became, in 2005, a high-level strategic dialogue. And then under the Obama administration, that became an even more formalized strategic and economic dialogue with multiple high-level meetings, formalized and recurring. And then there's even talk of a G2 condominium, which never really happened, but that would have been the hypothetical epitome of US-China diplomatic engagement. But there's also been hedging, and there's been a few different types of hedging, a lot of rhetorical, as I mentioned after Tiananmen Square, but the one I want to focus on here is renewal of ties to other Asian powers. So this is kind of the most obvious example of what I've made as sort of the theme of my presentation here, which is that whenever the U.S. has needed to hedge against China, it has partially done so by engaging the rest of Asia. So here you can see just a sampling of some of the more uh, prominent U.S. renewal of ties to the rest of Asia. As we have talked through some of those in earlier uh, panels, I won't go into them all in detail. But you can see trilateral, trilateral dialogues have been restored. Um, increased commitment to hard security treaty partners such as Japan, Australia, South Korea, Thailand, Philippines, um, engaging in ASEAN and East Asia Summit, and then the U.S.-India nuclear deal and also the U.S.-India strategic partnership, as was just mentioned. Um, those have all become linchpins of the U.S. hedging towards China diplomatically. I know there's a lot of people in the U.S. included that would like to see this uh, more explicit and a more commitment, but the U.S. has tried to do some of this uh, to the best that the political situation can accommodate. Finally, we go to the military dimension. So there has been some military engagement. The U.S. has conducted joint anti-piracy exercises, um, SHADE, which is a, basically a shared protocol for maritime uh, engagement, and then also counterterrorism intelligence sharing has probably been the most prominent one. So in the aftermath of the 2011 attacks, um, China has had terrorism problems in the Northwest with the Uyghur minority for a long time. And so the U.S. and China have uh, collaborated on that. And 
as I'll get to in my last slide, this is this may be ramping up soon as well uh, with ISIS. Um, but that has been the main area. But then there's also been a lot of military hedging, which is to be expected in the, the power dynamics the way they are with the U.S. as a Pacific power and China as the rising power in Asia. So there's been shows of military force, most notably the Taiwan Strait crisis, um, but also uh, with the U.S. flying B-52 bombers over the self-proclaimed East Asian Air Defense Identification Zone. Uh, recently, and even more recently, with the U.S. sending a destroyer uh, very close to a Chinese man-made island in the South China Sea. Um, and then probably the most prominent one has been the military contingency planning. So air-sea battle is a concept. It's actually called something else now, but um, it has been called air-sea battle for a long time. That's been developed in the Pentagon. And basically the concept in large part is predicated on uh, combating Chinese anti-area access denial capabilities, um, as were also mentioned earlier. And this has been a pretty prominent and divisive issue within the U.S. defense infrastructure. Um, but it's ensured that a lot of the long-range strategic thinking with uh, the Pentagon and the Department of Defense has been predicated on basically hedging against a future showdown with China and ensuring that the U.S. has the capability uh, to, if, to combat China if that ever were to occur. And then finally, going with the theme here, there have been military sales to other Asian powers, so ASEAN, India, um, several Chinese nationals were killed in the attacks in Mali, so there's hope that China will become more engaged on that. But there's also the worry that China has been uh, a bit hesitant to condemn the Assad regime. There's been friction there. Also, UN Security Council reform, so things like a permanent seat for India, that will cause friction because the U.S. has uh, supported that, whereas China does not want uh, to make the pie any larger with permanent members of the Security Council. Um, climate change, there's been some engagement on that recently, as I mentioned. There also, we'll see how that pans out with the Paris uh, meeting that's coming up. Management of Russia is a very interesting one because Russia, as we all know, has been um, aggressive towards the Ukraine and Eastern Europe, but it's also been aggressive in Syria, which now could be seen as a good thing um, by some in the U.S. because of the increased threat by ISIS. And then finally, cybersecurity is a huge issue between the two that will continue to be a source of friction, most likely. Um, Chinese companies have been engaging in uh, cyber warf warfare, whatever you want to call it, um, espionage against the U.S., and the U.S. has been trying to develop a response framework, but has, it's kind of unclear at the moment. So if the U.S. and China can collaborate on making a rules-based cybersecurity architecture, that would be a huge area for engagement, but it's also going to be tough, so it will be hedging. So thank you very much.